in the webinar. To do so, please type your question into the Q&A. Hi there, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Dr. Susie Hudson, and I'm the Clinical Director at NADA. Thanks for joining us that are contained in that database. So the first webinar was very much focused on the administration and collecting of data, recording of data, how to do that. And now we're going to really take that a little bit further and explore how we can use our data as we go along. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you and we're going to take you through some of the ways in which you can use your database data to inform clinical practice. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which I'm coming to you from today. We proudly acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which the NADA office stands. We extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia and pay our respects to Elders past, present and future. This is the NADA base team um, and along with myself, Tata De Jesus is always available to you um, either via the NADA base IT support email or just emailing us directly. So do reach out if you have any queries or questions about NADA base, um, its application or anything that you might be having trouble with in relation to data collection. Today's key learning objectives are really to understand the importance of quality and timely data collection and analysis, and to explore how to use data to inform organisational practice, and most importantly, to think about those different levels of how data can inform, both at the individual level, so informing the treatment that's being provided, the, the sort of staffing or organisational level, and then also at that more structural level to inform policy. Uh, and that's where a lot of our um, data will inform planning uh, in relation to treatment service provision. In terms of an overview of what we'll cover today, we're going to really explore what's in database um, and very specifically what reports and visualisations are available to you. We're also going to think about how visualisations can really help us to see change uh, and to understand what might be going on for you, for your client in particular, um, and in that one-on-one -on -one with the person who might be seeking treatment, or also at the service and organisational level. And then a little bit later on in the in the uh, webinar, we're going to be introducing you to members of the NADA Data Research Advisory Group. And they are people that who work at NADA services that are there to support their organisations in relation to data, uh, data collection and interpretation. And so we'll learn a little bit from them about how they've used their NADA based data to inform practice in their organisations. So let's take a little look at this animation now about why we collect data. As a worker, you can use the data to inform your clients about their treatment and their journey so far. Use the data to spark conversations and invite your clients to set goals for themselves. On an organizational level, you can evaluate your programs. You can check staff workload, Review the demographics of your client base, see how they're doing and how long they've been seeking treatment. Management and staff can make better decisions because it is backed up by the data you collect. And for the rest of the AOD sector, the data you collect helps paint a better picture of what the drug and alcohol sector looks like in New South Wales. When we collect data that is accurate and on time, we give ourselves opportunities to become better in the work we do. We can do more research to understand our sector better. We can lobby for sustainable funding and ultimately provide better care to our clients. Thanks, Tata. You can catch that animation on the NADA website. So what's in NADA base in terms of reports? Um, what you may be aware of is that we can extract national minimum data set and state minimum data set extracts. And they're the ones that we often provide uh, on a monthly basis to the state and then at the end of the year to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. You can also pull out individual reports and these are very specific to the person that you're working alongside. You can be sharing with them 
their progress as they move through a program or through um, months of counselling, for example. There are also organisational level reports, and these can tell us everything from who's coming through the door, uh, how we're going in terms of our data quality. It might also tell us something about the follow up rates for outcomes data collection. There's also the organisational dashboards and the public dashboard that you can access on the NADA website right now that bring to life in a visualisation the data that relates either specifically to your organisation, can only be seen by your organisation when you log on that first time to NADABase. And then the public dashboard is an aggregated, de-identified section of data that comes from the previous year's data collection of the um, minimum data set. In terms of the comms extracts, you can log on to NADABase right now, irrespective of whether you're an importer or you put your data directly into NADABase, and you can extract specific comms, uh, which is the client outcomes measurement um, extract, national minimum data set or state minimum data set in a variety of different formats, whether it's a PDF or a Word, an Excel um, uh, document. And that allows you to specifically explore and analyze and clean the data to your own for your own purposes. Um, uh, we've got lots of support for you uh, that we've obviously been working alongside for a long time, the University of Wollongong and um, Associate Professor Pete Kelly uh, and his crew. And so we've got lots of ways of tips that we can help you with if you would like to explore your data further. So don't hesitate to reach out if you'd like some more information about that. In terms of the individual uh, client outcomes measures reports, they really take into account the measures that you've selected as an organisation, whether that's the severity of dependence scale, the K10, if you're looking at mental health, um, symptoms of distress. Um, also, you could be looking at the quality of life. And what it does is it brings together those that individual person's data and maps it out across the different time points in which you may have been collecting the data. And what this tells us is, is that it's really important as an organisation or a service to get together, talk about the data that you're collecting and how it might inform the treatment you're providing, and to get some agreement about at what stages you might be collecting that data. For the purposes of analysis um, that we've done in partnership with tertiary institutions um, that involves the data that you collect um, every day, we have applied a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day follow up rate. So that is in line with what is frequently um, recommended around the frequency of when these client outcomes measures are asked. And in terms of those reports, it's really about, I suppose, allowing the data to tell you and to be able to discuss it with the person that you're providing treatment to so that you can make any adjustments that you may need to the treatment within real time. In terms of the specific organisational reports that are currently built in to NADABase, there's an activity summary report and that was really popped in there to assist particularly community-based services and it helps a lot with, um, it provides a lot of information about service contacts. So that is those um, service contacts or contact you may have with a client or person who's accessing your service over time. And it can tell you a little bit about uh, how many clients might be allocated to a particular clinician. It might tell you a little bit about how long a particular client has been with you or how frequent they're receiving therapeutic sessions. Uh, it's not obviously required in terms of a residential treatment setting. Uh, and it is very much specifically related to the state minimum data set. However, more and more now, primary health networks are requesting service contact data. Episode analysis reports really digs into those very specific elements of the minimum data set and national minimum data set and can tell you something about um, the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that may be accessing your service. It might tell you something about the principal drugs of concern and, and what, are, what 
might be coming through the door in terms of people's um, and substance use preferences. It may also tell you, uh, dig down into people's cultural identity um, in terms of their country of birth or whether they speak other and other language at home uh, and brings together, I suppose, all of those elements to provide a bit of a picture as to the type of person that's coming through your service. The organisation treatment outcomes report is as it suggests, brings together the outcomes that have been collected within a service. And once again, it's important to emphasise here that an outcome is pieces of data that have been collected, the same data collected at multiple time periods. And so that's why it's so important for all of us who are collecting the data on the front line to see the value of regularly collecting this data and to have it inform the treatment that we provide. The screener reports attend specifically to those uh, screener questions. So questions around domestic and family violence, um, suicidal ideation, bloodborne virus risk, um, and, and, and really provide some insight into some of those specific screeners. And most importantly, how we're going in terms of responding to those screeners. You know, for example, um, if uh, someone has indicated that they have not had a bloodborne virus or a um, sexually transmitted um, an STI check, um, then this will help you to, to ensure that, that those are being followed up and, and adequate support is being provided. The data quality reports really look at the quality of the data, whether there are duplications or things that you might need to attend to, whether the statistical linkage key elements are being done adequately. Quality is a really important part of data collection. And so we'd really encourage you, all members of your team, to regularly look at the data quality to report, to sort of tell us where things are going. Um, we'll also chase you up potentially uh, when the different logic checks or validations that are built into not only NADABASE, but into the Commonwealth uh, and state systems, whether there are any issues there. There's also the BTOM report, um, Brief Treatment Outcome Measurement Report, and that's um, not so regularly used by people, but it is available. And then there are graphic reports. And these, I suppose, provide some um, visualization of the outcomes measures that are contained in NADABASE. In terms of the organisational treatment outcomes report, this provides a really nice snapshot of where your um, clients are at. Um, it provides, usually within a time period, you're able to set that time period. It will then pull together all of those surveys that have been conducted within that time period. It also tell you there something about how many clients you're looking at in terms of the data provided um, and also uh, the specific measures that have been included um, in, in, this, in this regard. We're looking at the sever severity dependent scales, the quality of life and the K10. And then in terms of other reports, we felt it was really important uh, after a while, these static reports, while useful, um, didn't necessarily provide an opportunity for people to be really engaged by, the, by their data. And so we set about producing a database dashboard, and this is available to you at the, at the service level, the organisational level, and then that public level, uh, which I mentioned is also uh, available for the previous year's data on the NADA website. And so what this can provide you is an opportunity to interact with the data, to, to see what happens when you are selecting specific pieces of the dashboard. And you want to look at specific data, say, for example, that relates only to community and outpatient treatment provision. And so it will then slice and dice the data in a way that's quite visually appealing to tell you something more about uh, if I want to look just specifically at, at outpatient um, or community-based services provided to someone, say specifically around um, heroin use, you know, what does that look like? What's the, um, the sort of average age range there? Uh, what's happening uh, in, re in relation to who, who, who's actually coming through the door? And so we would strongly encourage you to have a look at those, to think about potentially how they may be improved for use. 
uh, but certainly um, a really useful way to explore your data. What we really have been trying and striving to do at NADA is to ensure that our whatever data we, do, we collect, that we support you to collect, it's about being ethical, it's about it being used and utilised so that whatever, whenever we're asking questions of people, we can actually make it informed treatment. And so this idea of visualising change is really important, that we take that data, that we look at it, that we, we reflect on it, but that also when we pre present it visually, we can provide the story that goes along with it. We know that stories from our um, clients and people who access our services are just as valid and as important as the numbers. And so we would encourage everybody when they're submitting reports or um, writing or in inserting data into their annual um, the annual reports, that they're also providing that story. We know that our colleagues, our um, commissioners and funders at the state and Commonwealth and PHN level want to hear those personal stories about the impact of treatment and how that's gone for the person, um, not just the data that's, that's there. What we've also been able to do by pulling together the data and visualisations is to really understand what's happening in the sector. And you can appreciate that what that's helped ANADA to do is to think about training opportunities, you know, what, what is coming through the door in our member services and what can we be doing to help those services more in terms of delivering high quality uh, care to those who they serve. And so we would really encourage you to have a look at some of the overall um, data and certainly the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare is a wealth of knowledge around what's happening across the country and within your own jurisdiction here in New South Wales uh, in terms of those who are accessing treatment. So we're pretty excited here at NADA that we now have 10 years of NADA based data and what that really assists us to say is that for a long time although the measures that were selected to be included in NADA base, the severity of dependent scale, the K10 in terms of mental health, um, the quality of life, so that is the EUROS uh, quality of life eight scale that really looks at uh, general health and wellbeing and the bloodborne virus questions. That, you know, this combination looking at the frequency of drug use, looking at um, how people are feeling and their general health and well-being, whilst all of those measures have some way of ascertaining whether there's been change at that individual level, the what we have been less clear about is what makes for a good outcome. Obviously, the most important thing is that the person themselves that's accessing treatment has reached the goals um, that they have set for themselves and that we've assisted and supported them to get there. However, we know that um, people are interested in um, just, you know, people, who, people from the community who are accessing services would like to know that the, the, the treatment that they're receiving is effective. And so now, with 10 years worth of NADA based data, we're able to start to be a little bit more confident about the quality of that care. And so this leads us to thinking about, you know, what is a good outcome? And what can we be starting to look at and explore to ensure that we're providing the best care that we possibly can? And so as mentioned before, uh, as part of a very clear, uh, close collaboration with the University of Wollongong and Peter Kelly and his crew, um, we sat down to really explore this data and to start to think about benchmarking and how what we have now can help individual organisations to think about how they're tracking uh, in, in relation to their own data. And so, of course, benchmarking requires comparative data. So that is a data set that you can compare your data to. Um, and the, the larger that data set, the greater its reliability and utility. So the other thing that's quite key to this process is establishing effectiveness indicators or those metrics that tell us whether treatment approaches are effective. So for example, you know, there are many times that um, uh, a NADA member 
organization or worker might say to me, you know, I just like to know what percent of people demonstrated meaningful change during their treatment episode and how do I work that out? And so we've been working quite closely um, with tertiary, with University of Wollongong and others. And I know that many of your services have been doing the same to explore and examine their own data in term, terms of that meaningful change. And so effectiveness indicators for NADA-based were established by looking at effect size, the standard error of measurement, uh, rates of reliable, reliable and clinically significant change. And we were able then to establish this effectiveness, effectiveness indicators for both residential, and in the case of this particular study, there were over 8,000 uh, individual people um, who, for whom we were able to look at their data and to establish effectiveness indicators for community settings. And in those settings, there are over 10,000 individual people that um, we were able to, to utilise um, in terms of their data. And this particular paper was very, very useful, not only because of what it's been able to yield, but it also demonstrates to us how much of a challenge it can be to have consistent outcomes collection. And so what this graph is telling you is the proportion of progress assessments that have been completed um, in terms of particular lengths of stay. And I mentioned before, um, this is around, you know, it's been split up into uh, people who've had any length of stay, those who've had at least 30 days stay um, within a treatment episode, 60 days and 90 days. And what you start to see is that the longer that people are maintained in treatment, the better or the um, more consistent the follow-up outcomes measures are collected. And so it does give us a little highlight of how important it is to provide our staff with the time and the support to, to actually administer those follow-up surveys so that we do have that data and we're more confidently able to say um, whether or not treatment was effective. And so the research specifically explored standard error of the mean score. And these reliable, the reliable change index and the clinically significant change. Now these are all three ways of exploring effectiveness. And so each of them, however, have um, a spe specific cutoffs in terms of what they would determine as being able to accurately measure um, whether there's been change. And that means whether there's been um, uh, improvement or no change or deterioration or, or getting worse. And so when looking at a standard error of the mean score as an approach, it is probably the least stringent in terms of change or, or assessing change. And it really looks to see movement between three and four points within a scale. So you may be familiar, of course, with the K10, that you add up the scores and the higher the score, the higher the distress or um, symptoms of depression. And that improvement would be indicated in terms of applying this kind of metric um, if there was change three or four points um, in any particular direction. For reliable change, you can see that there's um, a, a slightly more stringent um, cutoff in terms of, of saying that change has occurred. And that's between five and eight points. And then in terms of clinically significant change, um, it's around nine to 14 points. So you're seeing that each approach and all three were applied to this particular data set are telling us a little bit about something, um, are telling us more and more um, as, a, as they go along in terms of what would be classed as specific change um, up or down. And then I suppose, as, as I said, it's really looking at, looking at whether there's improvement, no change or deterioration. And so um, it's important when we're thinking about this data um, that we are needing to look at various ways of exploring it so that we're not putting all our eggs into one basket, that we're really um, examining it quite thoroughly. And we're thinking about, um, you know, all the things such as that, you know, 
all the factors that might be influencing whether or not there has been change over time. And we know that many of the clients that come to see us um, are quite complex. They have a lot of complex needs that we need to address. And so that's why for some people, um, you may not see a lot of change, um, specifically around their mental health scores, for example. And, and so what these measures help us to do is to take some of that into account um, and really looking at that particular individual um, and looking once again at that large body of data, which then starts to help us see what would be, could be expected um, from change. So that it's not, you know, it, it sort of accounts for some of that variation across different clients who, be, who may be coming and, and seeking treatment. Um, what was also interesting about this particular study is that there was significant change at each time point. And so it gives us some indication that this is a useful way of looking at the data. Um, however, there are caveats, obviously, whenever doing, doing this type of work. And often some of the concerns that people may raise is that idea of apples versus oranges. Are we really looking at the same type of service? And so that's why, particularly with benchmarking, it's so important to think about com making comparison with a service that's like yours, that's as similar to yours as possible, um, in order for you to feel that, that you are having that correct comparison. Obviously, you know, there's lots of caution around benchmarking. Um, but what we do know is that it can help an individual organisation to really track and see how they're going um, in comparison to what is a, a now a large data set of 10 years worth of data. The great news is that Pete and his crew have been able to produce um, quite easy to use spreadsheets. Um, so if you'd like a go, if you'd like to apply some of the, um, the analysis that they have done in this particular study so that you can start to have something comparable to, to compare with the, with the outcomes of this particular 10 years worth of data study, um, we can provide you with that support and help. The other thing to know is that we are currently in the process of building the, um, the outcomes changes. So those um, outcomes lines for each of the measures in Nardabase so that when you are able to look at your own data, you will see a particular line that indicates where, if you like, the benchmark is for each of those particular measures um, and breaking it down between a residential setting and a community-based setting. So any feedback that you have on any of um, the types of ways of looking at your data or how you'd like to explore it, please do reach out, um, as I said. And now we would really like to hear from our NDRAG members. So this is the NADA Data and Research Advisory Group members, and they come from services just like yours. And they're gonna join us now and tell us a little bit about how they have used their data and the difference it's made for their organisation, and most importantly, the people who are accessing treatment at their services. Okay, so um, just to reiterate to everybody today uh, that all of the information that I've been talking about through the webinar is available to you on the NADA website. There are webinars, um, particularly around how to look at the dashboard and all of its different features. There's also the tutorials. You'll find that when you log on to NADA Base, there are question marks throughout the um, platform itself and they point to various tutorials that you can access. Um, now, I'm very excited to have our three guests with me today, Des Hoy and Siobhan Hannan and Junwa Lee. Um, and I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves to you in just a moment. But I just wanted to let you know that um, the three representatives here make up part of the NDRAG group. And this is really important because what we at NADA feel is very important is that you, the members, the NADA members, inform what we are doing in relation to data. Um, so 
you may be aware that all of your organisations obviously sign consent around how data is used and we're very, um, we've provided a data management plan and all of these other documentation around data, data safety, security and ethics. And so if you would like any of those types of templates for your own organisation, you can also reach out to, to us for that. Um, but, and also that we have a um, ethics committee which um, looks at proposals where people are trying to access data. And so that it's always judged in relation to the, the, um, the outcomes for um, people who access treatment and also for our organisations to build the strength and story of NADA member organisations. So um, I would like to now turn to each of our panellists in turn, and I'd like to perhaps ask you to introduce yourself and where you're, which organisation you're representing, and perhaps to just tell us a little bit about how you've been using your data um, to tell a bit of a story or um, to engage and inform practice. So I might start with you, Des. Um, Des Hoy is from Nam Namajira Haven, um, but perhaps I'll hand over to you, Des, to introduce yourself and your role and, and your, about your organisation. Sure. Thanks, Susie. Hello, everyone. Thanks for your interest. Um, I'm Des Hoy. I work at the Namajira Haven Drug and Alcohol Healing Centre, which is a residential rehab for Aboriginal men uh, up on the north coast of New South Wales. I've been a project officer there for 10 years, um, and you're probably all familiar with the story that I wear many hats. Um, and in this instance, primarily as a quality officer responsible for quality management systems, um, which includes a big focus on in-house database design, data collection and analysis and reporting. So I'm a bit of a data champion um, in that respect. Um, so that's me. And Des, can you tell us a little bit about how Namajira has sort of used their data in, in sort of informing practice or um, yeah, in any of the ways that you might use your data? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, it's it's been a bit of a long road. Uh, one of the briefs when I first started was to actually get a database happening. Um, uh, and that was in 2013. So we tried a few, off, had a look at a few off the shelf systems that didn't meet our needs. Um, so we, we, we designed a, an in-house and had a, a Microsoft Access specialist develop one for us. Um, but in terms of how we use data to inform practice, I suppose I, I like to think of it happening on multiple levels. Um, the, the first one is to look at clinical and non-clinical outcomes that focus on individual clients. Um, the second one is to look at service performance in data collection. And I think Susie touched on those with um, looking at some of the benchmarking that happens in database. And the third one is to look at service or program level outcomes. Um, so it's, it's kind of a three pronged approach for me uh, and for us. Um, so for example, if we look at clinical and non-clinical outcomes that focus on individual clients, we try to um, automate some functions in our database. Um, so for example, we can use data for red flagging. So for example, uh, automatic alerts from risk assessments of, of individual clients. Um, so if someone scores say a moderate or above in a certain domain of a risk assessment, um, an alert will be flashed up in, in their record when someone's accessing the database. Uh, we can also flag concerns for future possible readmissions of clients. Um, some who might have some significant health issues or behavioural issues. Um, and uh, we also plan to generate alerts for, um, say, for example, when someone does a K10 and, um, and that score is above, say, a nominated threshold, we, we, might, we, we might look at generating an alert and that would then expect the caseworker then or, uh, or a psychologist or someone to take some action around that. Um, uh, we also look at um, client reported experiences. So we do exit surveys and they get recorded in the database and we can use a lot of the data out of that um, to, to tell us things about not just how the service is going, but also about individual clients. So for example, we can look at in an exit survey measures of confidence in managing life. This is self-reported by a client. We asked them how confident were you in managing your life before you came to Namatira Haven? And how are you confident 
now that, that you're about to leave. So, so we, we can have two measures and, and, and we can look at trends and scores in terms of, um, in terms of their confidence. Um, we also use a suite of questionnaires across a number of domains uh, that are administered on admission and at the midway point and on exit. So obviously that's things like the K10, the Hoopwall 8, um, a cultural connectedness questionnaire. Uh, the severity of dependence score or scale and the EQ5D. Um, and another area we look at is ex-client follow-ups. Um, but it's a difficult area for us because our, our, um, our, our population are difficult to follow up. They, <laughs> they just are. So, so we, we, we use an approach where if, if we happen to run into an ex-resident, say out in the street or something, we'll ask them how we're going, we'll ask some questions, and then we'll come back and we'll record, we'll record that responses. Um, but we'll also, if, um, if we know someone who knows that client, we will also ask them about how they're going. So that gets a bit anecdotal, but um, you know, it's, it's the best way so far that we found to be able to do some kind of follow-ups at least. Um, in terms of service performance in data collection, well, uh, we use some internal auditing as part of our quality management system. So we look at gaps in data and uh, we conduct quality data quality and integrity checks um, and look at things like volumes of case notes and the completeness of case planning. Um, we don't necessarily look at the quality of those. That's not my area. Um, or the appropriateness of case notes. That's not my area. Um, but we also try to do some analysis of, of whether data is being collected and entered when it should be. Um, and just in terms of service of program level outcomes, we look at things like the rate of applications that we receive for a service, how many of them will result in an acceptance and how many of them will then actually result in an admission. Um, so, you know, at, at the moment, I think we receive about 150 applications a year, but only 50 people end up coming through the door. So that tells, that's starting to tell us something about our, about our population and how we can start to reach out to them maybe a bit better, maybe support them a bit better in the, um, in the, in the pre-admission process. Um, we also look at things like the time on the wait list that people are spending. Um, and we also, with our client reported experiences, our exit surveys, we also ask questions about their relationships with staff and other residents, um, you know, the fairness of the rules that we have in place, the satisfaction levels with um, food and the facilities. Uh, again, we ask them the confidence in managing their life and we also ask them about recommending the service to others. So there are a number of measures that we can use there in terms of program level outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, we also do a bit of analysis around program completions compared to lengths of stay, um, often analysed by age. And then we also look at, say, reasons or the circumstances of discharge mm -hmm. compared to compared to the degree of program completion. So they're just some of the things we focus on, some of the things we look at. That's fantastic. Thanks, Des. And tells us something, you know, with what you're talking about, not just about the challenges around designing a system that's actually going to suit your service and how you've got to quickly get up to speed with those elements, but then also, you know, the challenge of follow-ups and ensuring that you're able to capture that data. I might turn now to Siobhan. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your role at ACON, Siobhan, and, and how are you guys using your data and, and some of the things that Des has been talking about, are they familiar to you? Yeah, thanks, Susie. Um, so I'm Siobhan Hannan, I'm the team leader of the Substance Support Counselling Service at Acon Health. Um, we're an LGBTIQ plus community health organisation. Um, and so, you know, we work with, you know, minority and priority population groups in, in relation to, to substance use. Um, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming to you from today. Um, I'm on Wangal Gadigal land um, and our offices are uh, throughout New South Wales on, you know, on various traditional lands. And I acknowledge elders past and present. Um, so one of the things that's really important about data collection for our organization um, is that it it's capturing, you know, the stories of people who are minority 
populations and the subsets you know within those minority population groups and you know there are um there are obstacles to to people within a variety of minority populations in accessing appropriate health care um accessing health care that is culturally safe um accessing health care that um is you know, is actively inclusive and wants to know who people are, wants to understand their lived and living experience and design services, you know, that fit, you know, for them. Um, that, so that when we talk about, you know, person-centred, um, it's truly person-centred. Um, so data collection is really, really important for our organisation and it's something that we advocate for in various other sort of sectors of healthcare. Um, so obviously we were thrilled when NADA uh, changed some of the data collection to include um, sexuality and, and gender um, data indicators because, you know, it is really important that we know who is accessing our services um, uh, you know the you know every minority population group you know needs to be um, singled out um, in that way for data collection I believe so that we can you know in whatever area of, of healthcare that you're delivering services that we are truly delivering that person-centered um, care. Um, so how we use um, the the NADA you know data sets um, is in a variety of ways. Um, uh, you know we have used it to contribute to three pieces of research that the organisation has done that's looked at um, looked at outcomes um, connected sort of the uh, you know the comms outcomes to um, to this experience of people um, accessing our services, um, and in doing so, you know what we've been able to do is is create a bit of a story, create a bit of a picture um, about you know our particular community, um, and and in some ways you know advocate for our service, advocate for the work that we do, um, and also. You know, be able to interrogate, you know, and and look at our clinical work and see, well, are we delivering what you know people want and need? Um, can we can we look at the outcomes and whether it be you know results of the comms or you know or look at you know who is coming to our service um, and um, and and justify the work that we're doing um, and and both reassure ourselves that, you know, we're, we're working effectively, um, but also examine where there might be gaps, where we might be less effective or where we're not reaching parts of our community that we need to reach. So a really simple example of that is over the 10 years I've been working at ACON, um, when I first started, we, you know, the, 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 the sort of percentages in terms of who was accessing our services, it was, you know, high 90s. It was, you know, um, cisgender gay men um, and primarily around methamphetamine use. Um, and now we can, you know, look at the data and see that we've got, you know, many more uh, trans and LBQ women accessing our services and the you know substance of concern have changed have shifted over time and um, and so you know we we can see from that data over a long period of time that we are reaching more people um, and so we've, we've got more diversity in terms of our our clients coming into the service um, uh, what else um, I mean, one of the things that I think is, um, you know, really important for for our service is is being able to use the the data and comms um, both to demonstrate, you know, kind of broadly, you know, to to our funders and um, you know and elsewhere, um, we've got a service. Here are you know here are the outcomes and and 
on one in one sense you know we could say that we are successful in in uh, achieving good outcomes for our clients um, but more importantly I think is how we can use you know that particular data collection process um, in you know therapeutically so sitting with clients and collecting the information that we collect in the SDS and the K10 and the WHO8 becomes a really important part of mm -hmm. understanding the client's current living experience. Um, and uh, it becomes part of, you know, giving clients language to describe what yes. they're experiencing because often clients, you know, don't necessarily have the language yet um it uh you know it's a way of of exploring you know not just you know the score is it a six and eight or a, you know a 10 or is it a 25 or a 35 but rather well this answer to this question you know what what does that mean you know how yeah. when you answer that question that you don't have enough energy for daily life mm. you know since when you know is that always or when did that start and how do you notice that and you know so it's not just about the score um it can become a really really useful tool um for uh creating you know the connection really thorough understanding of what's going on for a client um and then it becomes you know a sort of collaborative tool because we collect that information every four sessions um, and you know not everyone stays for four um, not everyone stays for eight or 12 but when you do get those clients that you are collecting the comms data particularly over a long period of time then it becomes a tool that you use in partnership where you can actually sit together when we used to sit in a room together um, or share screen and look at the graphs, look at the answers to the individual individual questions and and discuss. Bring them into you know, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's real partnership and mm -hmm. transparency. This is not just, you know, um, an organisation collecting yes. data and, and the data goes off somewhere. This is actually them. It's their story. Yes. Um, and woven into of, the therapeutic. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, one of the things that I love about um, the, um, the comms particularly is being able to print out, you know, the, um, the comms report for a client with the graphs in colour and, you know, and hand that over. And somebody has this physical evidence um, that, you know, they can look at and see oh, I started here and now I'm here. And Yeah, it's very you know, concrete, isn't it, Siobhan? Yes, yeah. it's so concrete. And, and even when, you know, you might be looking at that after a, you know, recurrence of use um, mm. or a return to, you know, regular use or something. And, and even then, you know, you can go back and look and say, but remember how you, st you were there then and now you, and yeah, okay, You've you've fallen off the horse, but look at how you made that happen yep. previously. That's um, brilliant. That's so, so brilliant. So you know, data is not just you know the statistics, you know yeah. the percentages. You know what I love about data it is it, that it is individual stories. Yes. Um, and and I think that that's something that is always really important to keep sight of because one of one of the traps, I think, can often be looking at an outcome and assuming something because of the number without knowing the story behind it. Absolutely. And so thanks, Siobhan. I think that's really important that we always put it um, in that context. Um, and I want to move now to you, Genoa. Um, Tell us a little bit about your role and, and just want to remind everybody who's watching if they can enter uh, questions into the Q&A box. Um, we will come to those. So please let us know what you're thinking. Um, I've got one question waiting here, but I'll come to that in a moment. So Genoa, tell us a little bit about your role and what's happening in terms of Odyssey's use of their data. Thanks, Susie, for having me. I think everybody... Um, 
acknowledges that the data is a very, very valuable thing. So for us, definitely we treat data as our strategic asset, and it's really a sexy thing to uh, work with as well. So a little, a little bit about myself. So I'm Jun Hua Lei uh, from Odyssey House of New South Wales. As you probably know, we are providing services across a number of settings. For example, residential, community, with your medical unit, parents and children program, et cetera, et cetera. So I have been working in the healthcare sector for uh, around 14, uh, 15 years. And I have been working in across a number of uh, healthcare settings as well, talking about hospitals, aged care, primary health care, and then now AOD. I think um, AOD is really interesting and different sector. There are lots of challenges which are really unique. And my roles have always been related to technology data and, and the projects. So from the Odyssey uh, perspective, so to make sure people understand the value of the data and to really leverage the data to make informed decisions and uh, you know, for strategic planning, et cetera, et cetera, we have done a number, a number of things. First of all, we uh, implemented a project. So the objectives uh, were very clear. So business processes have been redesigned and streamlined to support the current journey from end to end. Second objective uh, for that project uh, was really to redesign uh, our client management system, make sure it's fit for purpose. Because quite often we get a technological solution off the shelf and there are a lot of thinking required behind because the system will not do the job, will not actually directly support the operations. So that was really important. The third objective was really to improve the data quality. On the basis of that, we introduced uh, business intelligence capability as well. So for example, now we have like dashboards, a number of dashboards really kind of to have good understanding of uh, what happened to the client from the very initial inquiry to weekly stage to commencement of the program down, to, down the track to treatment delivery to uh, outcome does, does a connection. So that's the third objective. Last but not least, is really about people. I think quite often we, we kind of forget that because people, data quality is depending on what they put in. That's why people say garbage in, garbage out. So from that project, we really make sure uh, different stakeholders, you know, from the managers to frontline AOD workers to clinicians, everybody is clear about what they need to do and how to do it. So that was really important. It's a big initiative for the organization to do that project. So right after that, as I mentioned earlier, we introduced the business intelligence uh, capability as what well NADA has been working on as well. I think that's really powerful to, to really leverage uh, the, the value of data. So uh, another initiative is the uh, establishment of uh, data stewards group so comprising people from different teams across the organization and also representing different levels of the organization. It's like a desk was saying. So I think we have to have champions out there to really promote the value of the data. So this group we meet on a periodic basis, really kind of talking about data and also kind of learn from each other and also share uh, some basic Excel techniques to process data gen generating insights. That has been uh, working really well. Mm. Yeah, and apart from that, and also I think really important to remind ourselves as well, as the front line people collect data, we need to make sure we provide feedback. Yes. We need to kind of feel the connection there. Otherwise, they think you ask me to collect more data, what's that for? Yes, so I think that yes. feedback loop is extremely important. Yeah, these are the initiatives we have undertaken. Yeah, thanks, Junwa, and I think all of you, um, Dares and Siobhan and Junwa, have really emphasised how important it is that there is that feedback loop to the people we're collecting the data from, um, the people that are actually collecting the data, that it becomes woven, and that's the primary thing that it becomes woven into the practice. It informs the practice first, and yes, of course, we can use it for other purposes, such as demonstrating the effectiveness of our service provision. Um, I've got a question here about 
um, how to engage with researchers. Now, um, I know that all of you have had some um, experience of, of um, engaging with researchers. Is there anyone that would like to speak to that in particular? What, what's been helpful and how have you gone about it? I know, Siobhan, you in particular went through a process of evaluating your substance support service. Um, do you, can you tell us a little bit about what was important um, in terms of how to engage a researcher into, into your project? Um, look, I think in some ways, uh, it's not that engaging researchers is easy, but but because our service has that point of difference, um, therefore, you know there there are you know there's a uh, a desire for more data, more research in in our particular area because there's a lack of it. So there isn't much um, uh, you know evidence about practice when it comes to delivering LGBTQ plus specific services. Um, so there's an there's an eagerness, you know, to to look at that. So the point of difference is, I think, you know, what made a research project around um, our service and, uh, and and the and the evaluation sort of interesting um, for researchers. So I guess I'd say, you know, for any service, the point of difference is probably really really important, as well as, you know, in this instance. Um, how you can connect that to, you know, to in a way that you're able to sort of evaluate what the differences mm -hmm. are. Um, and I guess that's what we're moving, you're talking about, Nada, now having actually starting to develop those tools for services to look at comparing, you know, apples and apples or um, oranges and oranges, or perhaps sometimes apples and oranges. Yes, yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> And for others, um, have there been any experience of working alongside researchers as a way, something that you would indicate um, about that? Yeah, go ahead, Des. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, we, um, Namajira Avon, we're, we're involved in the NARDAN group, which is the New South Wales Aboriginal Residential Healing Drug and Alcohol Network. So we're a bunch of Aboriginal services who... Um, we got together and got funded to engage with NDARC, which is the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre out of the University of New South Wales. Um, so a lot of that legwork was actually done with us in terms of that, that initial engagement. But um, I, I would just make a few observations. Um, I, I suppose if, you, if you're clear about what you want researched, it makes it easier. Um, so, so, so you've got a pretty clear brief. Um, we, there are there are many researchers out there, and I've actually engaged with a few uh, one a few years ago, also out of the out of the Uni of New South Wales. Um, so universities are good places to go, um, and yeah, just just be clear about uh, about what you want researched and 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 what you want out of it. Yeah, yeah. I suppose too having that collective is quite useful to yes. be clear about making sure that it's going to be a benefit to you. Um, Junoa, have what about for Odyssey? Have you had experience, obviously, you know, working in partnership with researchers? Yeah, and actually, we had a longitudinal study around like two years to really understand some correlations between uh, demographic information and the treatment out outcomes or length of stay. I think that's really important. Back to what Des was saying, I think it's really important to understand uh, the research question to start with. And they're really thinking about some kind of a practical implications there. That's really important. And uh, one point I want to add is I think the Power BI, for example, like what NAD has been working on, that's a really fantastic thing. And just thinking about it, because of the interaction kind of experience, we can say what are the contributors, what could be the contributors for the length of stay, for the treatment outcomes. Now would really help us understand what could be the research questions we need to answer. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, everybody. Um, uh, we do have one more question, but perhaps we will provide an, uh, an answer offline. I want to thank very much Des and Siobhan and Junwa for, um, for being here today. And they're also available to you via the NDRAG. You can get in contact with myself or Tata De Jesus at NADA. Um, her email, um, her email address is tata at nada.org.au. Mine is Susie at nada.org.au. 
www.ethicsmoney.org.au. Um, and we have access to all these people. So if there are things that you're interested in doing, you do want support and help, that's what we're here to provide. And the NDRAG in particular is here to support NADA to ensure that we're doing what's good and best for our members, because that's what we're here for. So if there are things that you need help with or you want advice on or you want to be linked with, please reach out. I hope that this has been helpful for you today and the recording will be available to you in the coming days. Um, do reach out if you need and take good care. Thanks so much, everybody.